It was a mistake. I didn't want to cheat on you. These are the words uttered by the wife of the main character of this story. But adultery is a conscious choice. It can't be a mistake. And so, my dear viewer, let's find out how this story ends. And while you're listening, don't forget to put your royal like and subscribe to the channel. Let's go. The backyard was filled with the sounds of voices and laughter, blending into the perfect summer soundtrack. Children raced across the lawn, their bare feet brushing the grass, and their cheerful giggles mixed with the continuous sizzle of the barbecue. The family gathering was in full swing, and Charlie felt a sense of contentment amidst the joyful chaos. Standing by the grill, he carefully flipped the burgers, feeling the heat from the fire and the late afternoon sun warming his face. Charlie, you're going to turn them into charcoal, teased a voice from behind. His cousin Megan appeared, holding a bowl of potato salad and flashing him a cheerful smile. Charlie responded with his wide grin. Not a chance. These are Dad's culinary masterpieces, slow-cooked to perfection, he said confidently. The key is patience. Megan smirked, shaking her head. If they taste as good as they smell, I'll take your word for it. Charlie wiped his hands on a towel and glanced over to where Madison was chatting with their cousins, her laughter ringing through the air. She wore a light summer dress, her golden hair catching the sunlight as she threw her head back, smiling. Charlie couldn't help but smile softly. She looked radiant, as always. Hey, sweetheart, he called over the noise of the conversations. Need a drink? Madison turned slightly, holding an almost empty wine glass in her hand, her eyes already a bit hazy from a few rounds of drinks. I'm good for now, she replied, flashing him a quick smile before returning to the conversation. Charlie shrugged, not thinking much of it. Madison had always been the more social one, and if anyone needed to unwind, it was her. Family gatherings were their annual chance to let everything go, and she was simply enjoying the moment. As Charlie checked the steaks on the grill again, he noticed his younger brother Alexander approaching with a glass of whiskey in hand and a slight unsteadiness in his step. It was his third or fourth drink of the day, but that didn't surprise Charlie. Alexander had always been more carefree his energy a sharp contrast to Charlie's more reserved nature. These burgers are worth the trip, man, Alexander mumbled, giving Charlie a rough pat on the back. Charlie smirked, gripping the grill spatula a bit tighter. Only the best for the family. You know how Dad was? He aimed for perfection. Alexander grinned, but there was a distant flicker in his eyes. Yeah, Dad always wanted to get everything right. You're the only one who really took that seriously. Charlie smiled slightly, feeling an unspoken distance between them. Life had taken them in different directions, but family events always brought them back together, even if only on the surface. Just trying not to let him down, Charlie said quietly. Alexander took a long sip, his gaze briefly clouded before the familiar smile returned to his face. Don't get cocky. You're not good at much, little brother. Charlie rolled his eyes the usual banter easing the tension. Big words for someone who barely finished college. Alexander's loud laughter caught the attention of a few nearby relatives. Hey, but I finished, didn't I? And I'm doing just fine. Charlie glanced around the yard, watching the kids race toward the large oak tree at the edge of the lawn. Megan was now in the group of ants, helping set up the dessert table, while the older men had gathered in a circle, clearly discussing football. The scene was filled with warmth and family togetherness, but a growing unease stirred inside Charlie. Maybe it was the stress of hosting, or maybe it was something deeper, something that had been creeping into his thoughts more and more lately. His marriage with Madison, though it appeared normal on the surface, had changed. They had been together for 25 years, but a distance had been growing between them. Her smiles had become less genuine, her touches more infrequent. He couldn't quite pinpoint what had gone wrong, but he couldn't ignore the feeling that something between them was shifting. When Madison approached, Charlie quickly brushed aside the nagging thought. Her face lit up with a bright smile as she slipped her hand into his. She glanced at the grill, where the burgers sizzled appetizingly, with a playful glint in her eyes. Looks like our grill master is at it again, she teased, her eyes twinkling mischievously. 
This time you've really outdone yourself. Charlie smiled, pleased with her compliment. I try. Lowering her voice and leaning closer, Madison added with a playful tone, speaking of trying. But before she could continue, Alexander appeared. He slung a heavy arm over Charlie's shoulders, his whiskey glass dangerously wobbling. You won't believe what happened at work this week, Alexander interrupted, cutting her off before she could finish. Charlie shot Madison a quick, apologetic glance, but Alexander, as usual, was oblivious to what was happening. Madison's smile faded for a moment, but she brushed it off with a light shrug. I'll leave you boys to it, she said casually, though Charlie noticed a fleeting spark of irritation in her eyes as she walked away. Seriously, Alexander? Couldn't you wait five minutes? Charlie muttered quietly, trying to keep his frustration in check. But Alexander, as always, was unaware of the effect he had, and continued his story, gesturing animatedly. So I tell him, there's no way you're finishing this project by Friday, and he... Charlie's attention drifted as his gaze followed Madison, who had returned to her friends. She was laughing again, but now there was a noticeable distance between them. Sighing heavily, Charlie turned back to his brother's chatter. The evening continued, with Charlie mingling among relatives, chatting with family while keeping an eye on the grill. He and Madison exchanged polite smiles and brief touches, but the tension between them was impossible to ignore. Meanwhile, Alexander, now visibly drunk, grew louder, and his jokes became increasingly inappropriate. At one point, Charlie noticed Alexander and Madison talking near the drinks table. His brother's hand lingered on her back a little longer than it should have. Charlie felt a wave of discomfort but quickly pushed it aside. He's my brother, Charlie thought. It's probably nothing serious. Charlie, these stakes are amazing, his uncle shouted, pulling him out of his thoughts. Charlie forced a tight smile, though a sense of unease still lurked deep inside. As the sun finally set and the sky turned a soft purple, everyone gathered around the fire. Charlie sat next to Madison, wrapping his arm around her shoulders. For a moment, the warmth of the fire and the closeness of family helped ease the tension. Madison leaned into him, her voice almost a whisper. Isn't this evening perfect? Charlie nodded, relaxing a little. Yeah, it really is. But when he glanced across the fire and saw Alexander watching them, the unease returned, sharper this time. Alexander quickly looked away, but something in his expression sent a chill down Charlie's spine. In that brief moment, Charlie had no idea that this look would mark the beginning of a series of events that would soon turn his life upside down. The fire crackled softly as the last light of the day gave way to the deepening night. The gathering felt cozy, the air filled with the scent of burning wood. Charlie leaned back, his arm casually around Madison. It had been a long, eventful day, filled with laughter, good food, and pleasant memories. Surrounded by loved ones, he felt a deep sense of contentment. This was the life he had always dreamed of. Madison nestled closer to him, her head resting comfortably on his shoulder. She had had a bit more to drink than usual, but Charlie didn't mind. It was a night for celebration, and she deserved to relax a little. He smiled, pouring her another glass of wine chuckling softly as she giggled and took another sip. The flickering firelight danced on their faces, casting long, shifting shadows. Charlie glanced around at the gathered family, soaking in the feeling of warmth and togetherness. His cousin Megan was telling an awkward work story that had everyone rolling with laughter. Across the fire, Alexander was laughing too, though there was a tension in his laugh that Charlie barely noticed, attributing it to the alcohol. It wasn't unusual for Alexander to overdo it at these family gatherings. They all did from time to time. Charlie didn't think much of it. Suddenly, Madison's voice cut through the noise. Hey, guys, she called loudly, silencing the conversations. Charlie turned his head toward her, surprise flickering across his face. Madison's cheeks had flushed from the wine and she swayed slightly as she stood up. Madison, sit down before you hurt yourself, Charlie said gently reaching out a hand to steady her. But she stepped back, stumbling again, and raised her glass high above her head. I have something to say, she announced, her voice louder now, with a faint slur creeping in. The room immediately fell silent. 
A few nervous chuckles rippled through the guests, as if they were expecting her to blurt out a drunken joke. But Charlie's smile vanished, and a sinking feeling settled in his stomach. His eyes darted to Alexander, whose face had gone pale. Charlie gripped his whiskey glass so tightly his knuckles turned white. Madison took a deep breath, her gaze sweeping across the faces of the gathered family members. Despite her unsteady stance, Madison didn't sit down. Charlie was finding it harder and harder to understand her behavior. And then, without warning, she blurted out the truth. I've been sleeping with Charlie's brother for seven years, she said, her words slicing through the air like a sharp knife. For a moment, it felt like the world had stopped. Charlie's thoughts froze, her words hung in the space between them, slowly sinking in. He blinked, his mind refusing to believe what he had just heard. This couldn't be real. He must have misheard. What? What did you say? He muttered, barely able to find the strength to speak. His heart pounded in his chest, his ears ringing as reality began to settle in. I'm cheating on you with your brother, Madison repeated louder this time, her voice cutting through the soft crackle of the fire. Charlie felt the air leave his lungs as if he'd been punched. He looked at Alexander, who was staring at the floor, refusing to meet his gaze. It was true. The guilt was written all over Alexander's face. Around them, gasps echoed off the walls in the shocking silence. The conversations abruptly ceased. The laughter and chatter that had filled the room vanished, and all eyes turned to Madison, then to Charlie. Her confession hung in the air like a thick fog, suffocating the atmosphere. Charlie's mind raced, trying to process what he had just heard, but Madison wasn't finished. And you know what? She continued, her voice now sharper, the slur in her speech gone. I don't regret a single second of it. She looked at him, her eyes gleaming with defiance. We even did it while you were home, right under your nose, she said mockingly. And honestly, it was one of the best experiences of my life. A cold chill swept over Charlie's body. His chest tightened, as if someone was squeezing the life out of him. This couldn't be real. The woman he loved, the mother of his children, was standing before everyone, mocking their marriage and bragging about her affair with his brother. Madison, why are you saying this? His voice trembled as he forced the words out. She glanced at him briefly, her expression devoid of remorse. You heard me, she said coldly. Seven years, and I wouldn't change a thing. Charlie's hands shook as he tried to rise from his seat. His legs felt weak, his heart pounding with a mixture of rage and heartbreak. Alexander, still avoiding Charlie's gaze, let out a faint, bitter smile. It wasn't an apology. There wasn't even a hint of regret. Slowly, he pulled out his phone, his fingers sliding across the screen. We even recorded it, Alexander said, his voice shaky but tinged with the same twisted satisfaction. Do you want to see it? Charlie froze his mind paralyzed by the horror unfolding in front of him. Around him, the other guests stared with wide eyes, too shocked to move or speak. Alexander wasn't bluffing. He tapped his phone, and suddenly the familiar sound of moans filled the air. A heavy silence enveloped the room, everyone too stunned to react. Charlie's vision blurred as a wave of fury washed over him. His entire body tensed, his fists clenching so tightly they began to tremble. The man Charlie trusted more than anyone in the world, his own brother, had now laid bare his betrayal for all to see. In that moment, something inside Charlie broke. Years of tension, pent up inside, finally burst free. Without thinking, driven by pure rage, he lunged forward, acting purely on instinct. Before anyone could react, his hands had already grabbed Alexander by the collar. You betrayed me, he shouted, his voice hoarse with fury. The force of the blow knocked Alexander off his feet, sending him crashing to the ground. The distant crackle of the fire seemed to fade, drowned out by the roaring in Charlie's ears. His heart pounded so loudly that he couldn't hear anything else. How could you? he demanded, his voice raspy, almost unrecognizable. The accusation burned in his throat as he screamed it. With Alexander pinned to the ground, Charlie barely noticed the shock on his brother's face. Years of unspoken resentment, broken trust, and hidden betrayal erupted in a furious blow. 
his fist connected with Alexander's jaw with a dull crunch, the sound of the strike echoing in the silence around the fire. Alexander groaned, his hands weakly raised in an attempt to defend himself, but it was useless. Charlie had lost control, consumed by a rage too powerful to stop. He raised his fist again and struck, his knuckles scraping against his brother's face, but the pain didn't matter. Charlie, stop! Megan shouted, rushing toward them, but her words barely pierced the storm in his mind. Charlie's vision blurred, the roar of blood in his ears deafening, and his body shook with anger. He shoved Alexander with such force that it seemed the earth beneath them groaned in pain. You pathetic coward! Charlie screamed, his voice trembling under the weight of his fury. How could you do this to me? How could you betray me like this? Grabbing Alexander by his shirt, Charlie lifted him off the ground only to throw him back down with such rage that the ground seemed to tremble. You slept with my wife, Charlie growled, his face inches from Alexander's. You've destroyed everything. Alexander, dazed from the assault, weakly raised his hands in a feeble attempt to push Charlie away. I, I'm sorry, he mumbled, but the words were empty, devoid of any real remorse. Charlie heard the cowardice in his voice. He knew Alexander wasn't truly sorry. Madison stood a few steps away, her face pale, the defiance in her eyes replaced with emptiness. She made no move to intervene, said nothing. Around them, family members were frozen, some in shock, others turning away, unable to watch what was unfolding. The crackling of the fire mixed with muffled gasps of disbelief from the onlookers, but no one dared to step in. Alexander writhed under Charlie's grip, his lips split, blood streaming from his nose. He coughed, his voice barely audible, broken by pain and fear. Charlie, please, stop! But Charlie no longer cared about his brother's pain. All that mattered was justice, punishment for the seven years of lies and betrayal that had happened behind his back. This is your punishment, Charlie growled his breath heavy and ragged. He raised his fist again, ready to strike, but a voice stopped him. Charlie, stop! Madison's voice trembled, filled with terror as she stumbled toward them, her eyes wide with fear. The bravado she had shown earlier was gone, replaced by sheer panic. Her hands shook, and she could barely stand. Slowly, Charlie turned to her, his chest heaving with the effort. You! He hissed, his finger trembling as he pointed at her. This is your fault. You've destroyed everything. Madison recoiled, her face turning deathly pale, tears streaming down her cheeks. I didn't, she began, but Charlie rudely interrupted her. Don't you dare try to justify this, he shouted, his voice trembling with emotion. Do you think a simple sorry can fix everything? Madison covered her face with her hands, her body shaking under the weight of her actions. Charlie, please, I never wanted... Charlie waved his hands in frustration, no longer able to contain his anger. Never wanted what? he yelled. To destroy our family? To throw away 25 years of marriage for this? He furiously pointed to Alexander, who was lying on the floor, gasping for breath. I was drunk, Madison whispered, trying to explain, but her voice broke. She stepped forward, reaching out to Charlie, but he recoiled, his face twisted with disgust. Being drunk excuses you? Charlie spat with contempt. Seven years, Madison, seven years behind my back, with my own brother. His voice shook under the weight of the betrayal. His gaze shifted to Alexander, who had slowly sat up, his face bruised and bloodied. Charlie inhaled sharply, trying to calm himself, but the anger overwhelmed him. You think this is it? He growled, glaring at Alexander. You think a few punches will even the score? Alexander flinched, wiping the blood from his lips but he couldn't find the words. The guilt was too overwhelming to speak. With a swift motion, Charlie grabbed Alexander by the shirt, lifting him off the floor. You ruined everything, he growled through clenched teeth. My marriage, our family, how could you? How could you do this to me? Alexander barely managed to speak, his voice barely audible. Charlie, I didn't mean... Shut up, Charlie roared, trembling with rage. You don't have the right to apologize. You can't fix this. Madison, still shaking, reached out again, her voice weak. Charlie, please. Don't touch me, Charlie snapped, turning to her, his eyes blazing with fury. 
Do you really think you're innocent? You smiled, you laughed, and all the while you were tearing down everything we built. I didn't, Madison gasped, but the intensity of Charlie's glare silenced her. You did this, he shouted, his voice trembling with grief. You threw away everything we had, for this. He let go of Alexander, standing over both of them, his fists clenched so tightly that his knuckles bled, but he didn't feel the pain. Do you think your tears mean anything now? His voice was hollow as he looked at Madison, who was openly sobbing, her body racked with uncontrollable sobs. I'm sorry, she sobbed, desperation in every word. Charlie, please, I'm so sorry. Enough. Charlie's voice turned eerily calm, a chill sweeping through the air. Stop. He turned away from her, his gaze shifting to the rest of the family, who stood frozen, horrified by the unfolding scene, no one daring to intervene. Taking a deep, unsteady breath, Charlie trembled all over, struggling to contain the raging fury inside. You two deserve each other, he muttered, disdain dripping from every word. His eyes lingered on Alexander for a moment, who sat with his hand pressed to his mangled face. You destroyed everything, and you don't even care. Without another word, Charlie left, his fists still trembling, his heart pounding wildly in his chest. He didn't know where he was going or what he would do next. The only thing he understood was that the life he had built over the years, the love he had cherished, had been destroyed in a single moment of betrayal, and nothing could ever fix it. Charlie's cold, brutal reality was all that remained of his life. The icy night air whipped against his face as he sped down the highway, the headlights of oncoming cars blurring through the tears that flooded his eyes. The family gathering now felt like a nightmare from another world, but the anger still churned within him, driving him toward a darker place. Thoughts swirled like a storm, his fingers gripping the steering wheel so tightly that his knuckles turned white. This isn't the end, he muttered, his voice barely audible in the silence of the empty car. They will pay. For everything. Madison's cruel laughter echoed in his head her biting words spoken in front of everyone at that horrible family reunion. The thought made his stomach turn, but what hurt even more was the memory of Alexander, his own brother, proudly showing humiliating videos as if it were some sick joke. Charlie's heart thundered in his chest, every beat resonating with a single purpose, revenge. He veered sharply off the road into an empty parking lot, slamming the car door shut in a fury. The freezing wind cut through his skin as he paced the desolate lot, his breath ragged in the quiet of the night. Logic had long since abandoned him. He wasn't looking for apologies. Forgiveness wasn't even on the table. No, he wanted to see both of them crushed, broken the way they had broken him. How could they do this to me? How could they betray me like this? Charlie muttered, pulling his phone from his pocket. He stared at it for what felt like an eternity before an idea began to take shape in his mind. The fog of his rage crystallized into something sharper, far more dangerous. He didn't just want to hurt them. He was going to destroy their lives, piece by piece. The first call he made was to his lawyer. Madison wouldn't get a cent of his money, not a single penny. Charlie, it's late. What's going on? His lawyer, Daniel, answered in a groggy voice. I want to start divorce proceedings. Now. Charlie's voice was flat, emotionless. I want her to walk away with nothing. Absolutely nothing. There was a pause on the other end of the line. Charlie, calm down. What happened? She's been cheating on me. Charlie spat, his voice dripping with bitterness. For seven years, with my brother. I want her out of my life and I want her to get nothing. Can you do that? Daniel hesitated before replying. I'm really sorry to hear that, Charlie. We can start the process, but it will take time. We'll need solid evidence. Don't worry, I've got plenty, Charlie replied coldly. The next part of his plan was to invade Alexander's personal life. For years, Charlie had known his brother was careless when it came to protecting personal files and videos. It had been a running joke between them, Alexander's recklessness with privacy. Now, that recklessness would be his downfall. Charlie wasn't a tech expert, but he knew enough. After hours of digging through old emails and forgotten accounts, he finally gained access to Alexander's cloud storage. 
His stomach twisted as he began downloading the files, his heart pounding with each new video that appeared on the screen. It wasn't just about Madison. Alexander had been reckless, recording his intimate encounters with numerous women, some of whom Charlie recognized. As he watched the recordings, a strange detachment began to form within him. It was like watching the complete collapse of his former life unfold right before his eyes. Each file he found only fueled his anger, but at the same time, it gave him something important. Control. With these videos, he could ruin Alexander, destroy his relationships, his career, his entire life. I'll burn it all to the ground, Charlie whispered, leaning back in his chair, his eyes fixed on the screen. They'll regret crossing me. But having the videos wasn't enough. Charlie wanted them to face public disgrace. He wanted to see them squirm when the truth came out. He wasn't going to let them escape the consequences. The first anonymous letter was sent the next morning. It was addressed to a carefully selected group of distant relatives. Charlie knew it would spark whispers and rumors, but it was only the beginning. Charlie pressed send, and in his mind, waves of shock began to unfold. Surprised glances, whispered conversations, and the slow unraveling of the carefully constructed image of his brother. By midday, the first responses started coming in. Charlie, did you see this? His cousin wrote, attaching a screenshot of the letter that had already started circulating. Charlie didn't respond. He didn't need to. The real chaos was only beginning, and he could feel it. A few days passed, and the rumors took on a life of their own. His phone buzzed constantly with messages from relatives and mutual acquaintances. Some expressed concern, others were just curious, but the reaction was unanimous. Disbelief. The videos hadn't yet reached a wide audience, but Charlie knew it was only a matter of time. He had sent them to people notorious for being unable to keep secrets. As the whispers grew louder, Charlie felt a small sense of satisfaction, though it wasn't enough. He wanted more. He wanted them humiliated not just within the family, but in front of the whole world. A few days later, Charlie moved to the next phase of his plan. Using an anonymous account, he uploaded the videos to public platforms where they would inevitably attract attention. He blurred the faces and removed details that could directly link him to the content, for now, at least. The damage, however, was already done. Alexander's phone lit up with endless notifications. Soon, it wasn't just a family issue anymore. Colleagues found out about the scandal, and rumors started spreading at his workplace. His reputation began to crumble. People gossiped in the hallways, and his boss started calling him in for meetings, trying to uncover the truth behind the rumors. Alexander denied everything, but the evidence was undeniable. Madison wasn't spared either. The shame of their affair becoming public in their social circle weighed heavily on her. She cut off communication and her friends, feeling awkward about the situation, gradually stopped returning her calls. She found herself trapped in a mess of her own making, suffocating under the weight of the truth that Charlie had unleashed. But for Charlie, even this wasn't enough. Each time he heard their names, every new rumor about their suffering brought him a fleeting sense of victory. But it was always short-lived. Beneath it all, a fury remained, driving him to go further. One evening, Charlie found himself parked outside Alexander's apartment. The night was bitterly cold, and he watched as lights flickered on inside. He knew Alexander was there, likely trying to piece together the remains of his shattered life. Charlie's phone buzzed again. This time, it was a message from Madison. Charlie, please, can we talk? I know I messed up. I'm sorry. Just stop. Charlie stared at the screen, his fingers hovering over the keyboard. For the first time since that fateful family gathering, a heavy weariness washed over him. It wasn't from lack of sleep, but something deeper, as if his soul had been drained. He didn't reply. Instead, he leaned back in his seat and closed his eyes, letting the cold seep into the car. Revenge had consumed him entirely, and now, for the first time, he wondered what would be left of him when it was all over. Two months passed but Charlie's rage didn't subside. Every morning he woke up with the same bitterness, the betrayal still burning in him as it had on that night at the family gathering. 
Madison's and Alexander's lives had fallen apart, just as he'd planned. Their reputations were ruined, friends and family had turned away from them, and Alexander had even lost his job. Yet despite all of this, Charlie hadn't found peace. Instead, he felt trapped by his own anger, suffocating in it. He had cut himself off from nearly everyone, even those who tried to help. Friends stopped reaching out, and his parents could no longer bear to watch their son spiral into darkness. Charlie rarely left his apartment. His life had devolved into a grim routine of work, drinking, and simmering resentment. One particularly cold evening after downing several glasses of whiskey, his eyes fell on the empty bottles scattered across the kitchen. His thoughts returned once more to Alexander and Madison, and the familiar fury began to boil inside him, stronger than ever. He knew what he had to do. He had to confront Alexander one last time. Under the influence of alcohol and an unbearable urge to put an end to everything, Charlie grabbed his keys and rushed out of the house, barely pausing to close the door behind him. His car roared down the dark streets, the city lights blurring into streaks as he sped toward Alexander's house. The stillness of the night only amplified the tension in the air. It was that ominous calm that always precedes a storm. One thought dominated Charlie's mind, leaving him oblivious to road signs and dangerous turns as he flew past them. The house Charlie approached looked modest, nothing like what one might expect from a confident man who once lived for his own pleasure. The windows were dark, showing no signs of life, but Charlie knew Alexander was inside. His fist thundered against the door, each knock louder than the last, echoing down the quiet hallway. Inside, hesitant footsteps could be heard, and soon the door cracked open, revealing Alexander's pale, stunned face. Charlie, what the hell are you doing here? Alexander mumbled, squinting against the harsh light spilling from the hallway. He reeked of alcohol, and the apartment was a mess. Empty bottles and scattered clothes were everywhere. Alexander's world was crumbling, but that was the last thing on Charlie's mind. You ruined everything! Charlie burst out, his fury wild and unchecked. He shoved the door open, storming inside before Alexander could react. Staggering, Alexander backed away, his eyes widening in fear. What are you even talking about? You took everything from me, Charlie growled, his fists clenched, feeling the rage flood through him. You think losing a job or a few friends is bad? You destroyed my life, my marriage, my future, and you just keep going like nothing happened. Charlie advanced toward him, his figure menacing, barely containing the violence simmering beneath the surface. Alexander retreated, fear spreading across his face. Charlie, I'm sorry, I swear. I didn't mean for it to go this far. I made a mistake. We both did. But this... He gestured weakly at the chaos around him. This won't fix anything. But Charlie wasn't listening. Sorry, he hissed, his face inches from Alexander's. Apologies mean nothing now. You took everything from me. Now you're going to pay for it. In an instant, Charlie's hands wrapped around Alexander's neck and the hatred that had been festering inside him exploded. His grip tightened and Alexander's eyes bulged in terror, his hands desperately clawing at Charlie's wrists. You think you can destroy my life and get away with it? Charlie's voice was low, seething with the fury boiling inside him. You think I'll let you walk away from this? Alexander tried to speak, his lips moving, but no words came out. His face turned red, his eyes wild with fear, his breath choked off. At that moment, something snapped inside Charlie. Years of suppressed anger, bitter resentment, they all became real, violent, uncontrollable. Alexander's legs gave out and he struggled helplessly to free himself from Charlie's hold. He staggered, and in that terrible instant, Charlie shoved him harder the movement awkward but forceful. Alexander's body twisted unnaturally, his head hitting the corner of the table with a dull crack. The sound echoed through the room, freezing time. Charlie stood motionless, his breath caught in his throat. Alexander lay crumpled on the floor, his neck bent at an unnatural angle, blood slowly pooling from his head onto the carpet. The sight overwhelmed Charlie, the weight of what he had done crashing down on him. He stumbled back, his hands trembling uncontrollably, his thoughts spinning in chaos. No, 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 he whispered, retreating in panic. This wasn't how it was supposed to end. He had wanted justice, 
Revenge, but not at this cost. Not this. Charlie dropped to his knees beside Alexander, his hands trembling uncontrollably, hovering uncertainly over his brother's motionless body. His mind raced as he stared at Alexander, but his brother's chest didn't rise. There wasn't the slightest sign of life. Alexander's eyes were wide open, but empty, cold and devoid of the spark that once filled them. Alexander, Charlie whispered, his voice breaking with despair. He grabbed his brother's shoulders, shaking him, begging for some kind of response, anything. But nothing happened. The room seemed to close in on him, suffocating with its oppressive silence, broken only by his ragged, heavy breathing. Somewhere in the distance, a voice could be heard. Maybe a neighbor? Charlie couldn't tell. He was trapped in a nightmare, his mind drowning in disbelief. This wasn't supposed to happen. Not like this. Not now. But suddenly the piercing wail of sirens sliced through the night, growing louder as they approached. The police had arrived, but it was already too late. The officers burst into the apartment, their eyes instantly locking onto the scene before them, Charlie kneeling beside Alexander's lifeless body, his hands covered in blood. Get up! Show me your hands! One of them yelled, aiming a gun at him. Charlie didn't move. He barely registered their presence. He was consumed by numbness, the weight of what had happened crushing him into silence. Slowly, he rose to his feet, raising his hands in surrender, his mind blank. The police acted swiftly, cuffing him and reading him his rights, but their words sounded like a distant, meaningless echo. Charlie's life had just been shattered, and nothing they could say would change that devastation. As they led him out of the apartment, he cast one last look at his brother's lifeless body. The rage that had tormented him for so long was gone, leaving behind only unbearable emptiness. The revenge he had sought was complete, but the cost was far higher than he could have ever imagined. Meanwhile, Madison sat alone in her apartment, crushed under the weight of the news. Alexander was dead. The realization hit her like a sudden, overwhelming blow. Her life had completely collapsed. Her marriage, her pride, and the man she loved. Quiet tears rolled down her face as she finally understood, too late, the consequences of her actions. Charlie had lost everything, but so had she. She was left without a husband and without a lover. My dear viewer, I hope you enjoyed this story because I have another story in store for you ahead. Let's go. Please don't divorce me, Emma pleaded through her tears to her husband. However, his response crushed any hopes for reconciliation. James had been married to Emma for the past seven years. They had met at a print shop where she was interning. Their relationship developed quickly, and soon they were discussing monogamy. James was captivated by her beautiful legs, her smile, and her quirky habit of wearing his old T-shirts around the house. She liked the comfort and familiarity of his worn shirts, which she often wore with nothing underneath, something that greatly amused James. James's upbringing had left emotional scars on his soul. His father left when James was still a child and later remarried. It wasn't until James was a teenager that he learned his father's infidelity had destroyed their family. James's stepfather never tried to be a real parent either. As a result, James harbored negative feelings toward his biological father, who stopped visiting him soon after he left. Growing up with a sense of being unwanted, James was determined not to repeat his father's mistakes and made his views on fidelity clear early on in his relationship with Emma. Though Emma couldn't fully understand the struggles James had faced as a child, she agreed that fidelity was a non-negotiable part of their relationship. Emma, being an only child, could sometimes be quite stubborn. James thought they balanced each other well. He knew how to calm her down when she became too self-centered. Their life together was strong from the beginning, although James felt that their lavish wedding had been slightly excessive. One of their favorite activities was going to musicals at the local theater. They had season tickets, and each theater outing turned into a romantic evening with dinner before the show and dancing afterward. James also enjoyed watching college sports, though professional sports didn't interest him much. James was a professional architect, specializing in urban planning. After earning his master's degree and passing his licensing exam, he became a certified architect. While it sounded impressive, 
James joked that his job was all about designing space for people and deciding where they'd store their things. Emma worked at a law firm. Mrs. Nancy Simpson, one of the partners, demanded that her female employees be modest, respectable, and moral. As a result, Emma always dressed conservatively, preferring pantsuits. This didn't bother James at all. In fact, he was pleased that other men couldn't admire her legs. One day, Emma told James that one of her best friends from school was getting married. The wedding was to take place in her hometown, and the bride's wealthy family had paid for airfare and accommodations for everyone in the wedding party. Most guests planned to stay for a week, but Emma had an important court hearing on Monday, so they planned to leave on Sunday morning. Early Thursday morning, James and Emma headed to the airport. During a layover, James noticed Emma reviewing documents for her upcoming case. He gently teased her, doubting whether she could relax during the trip. Emma assured him she could manage both work and leisure time. After arriving at the resort and checking in, James and Emma went to a restaurant. While Emma was in the restroom, the resort manager approached James. Good afternoon, senor. My name is Robert. If you need anything, don't hesitate to ask, the man said warmly. Wanting to ease his concerns about Emma's documents, James asked about the security of the room safes. Robert assured him that the resort had a top-notch security system. Cameras were installed throughout the property, and access to rooms was logged in detailed records. He even offered to print out daily reports of activity in their room for James. That evening, the wedding guests had a meet-and-greet. James hardly knew anyone there except for Emma. After dinner, the DJ started taking song requests, and people began dancing. James and Emma danced to a few upbeat songs before he began to feel tired. When they returned to their seats, a man approached Emma and asked her to dance. She agreed, but only for the fast songs. James watched as she danced with the stranger and then came back for a drink. Soon, another man invited Emma to dance. Without looking at James, she agreed. Distracted by a conversation about golf, James didn't immediately notice that Emma had disappeared from his sight. He went up to the second-floor balcony to find her and saw her in one of the dance areas, performing moves with her partner to fast music. Just as James was about to go back downstairs, the music changed to a slow melody. He froze, watching as Emma first pulled away from her dance partner. But not seeing James at their table, she allowed the man to pull her closer, and they started swaying to the rhythm of the music. Anger and pain boiled inside James as he resolutely headed towards them to confront Gabriel. What the hell happened to no slow dances? he demanded. Emma's eyes widened. I forgot, she stammered. I'm sorry. James turned on his heel and headed toward the elevator, throwing over his shoulder. If you're not in the room in five minutes, I'll destroy your court documents. Emma hurried to gather her things and barely made it to the elevator before the doors closed. In their room, she tried to apologize again, saying she might have had too much to drink. But James didn't believe a word she said. Nonsense, he responded coldly. Get out of my sight. That night, he slept on the couch, consumed by anger and a sense of betrayal. The next morning, he and Emma barely exchanged words over breakfast. James told her he was going to play golf with the other guests. Emma said she planned to go shopping. Before they parted ways, James reminded her that they needed to be back at the hotel by five o'clock to help with the preparations for the rehearsal dinner. During the golf game, James's partner, Michael, called his wife to check on how the shopping was going. Hearing this, James decided to call Emma. When she didn't answer, he left a message. A little while later, Emma called back. Hi, honey, how's the shopping going? James asked casually. We just got back, Emma replied. I see you called. Yeah, we were a bit delayed on the course, so I thought I'd check in, James explained. I must have missed your call. You know how noisy those shopping malls can be. The taxi just dropped us off, Emma said. Will you be back soon? James asked. I'll be there in about an hour or so, Emma answered. See you then. As James was heading back to the hotel on the shuttle, he received a message that the activity log for his room was ready at the front desk. Out of curiosity, he picked up the envelope and skimmed through the report. The entries for the previous night seemed normal, 
but today's didn't match the movements of either James or Emma. Concerned, James approached the manager, Robert, and asked to review the surveillance footage. They saw Emma leaving in the morning for shopping. The cameras captured her returning around noon to drop off the shopping bags, but just a few minutes later she left the room again, this time wearing only a long men's t-shirt. Can you follow her? James asked Robert. The footage tracked Emma's path through the resort. James's fists clenched when he saw her enter another guest's room. Room 410. Time seemed to stop as James stared at the closed door, wishing this were a mistake. About two hours later, Emma emerged. Her hair was disheveled. James felt sick as he watched her quietly return to their room, change her clothes, and throw the t-shirt into the hallway trash can before leaving again. James sat in shock, his world falling apart before his eyes. Robert, realizing the gravity of the situation, quietly printed screenshots of the compromising footage. With trembling hands, James took the envelope. Is there anything else I can do for you, sir? Robert asked softly. James nodded, his voice hollow. The t-shirt she threw away. Can you get it for me? Fifteen minutes later, he had the shirt. When James saw it, he understood why Emma had disposed of it. He put the shirt in a plastic bag and hid it in his jacket, not wanting Emma to know he suspected anything. When James entered their room, Emma greeted him cheerfully. Hello, darling. Do we have time to have a little fun before the rehearsal? She purred suggestively. The thought of intimacy with her after what he had just learned made James shudder. He muttered an excuse about an upset stomach and slipped into the shower, needing time alone to process everything. As they prepared for the rehearsal dinner, Emma noticed that James seemed to be in a bad mood. Maybe I can cheer you up tonight, she suggested, winking. Unlikely, James responded coldly. Emma looked stunned but didn't push further. Throughout dinner, James silently simmered with rage. He noticed that the man Emma had danced with the previous night now avoided eye contact with him. James also learned that the occupants of room 410 were William and Jennifer Miller, old school friends of Emma's. After dinner, the music began again. Will you dance tonight, darling? Emma asked hopefully. No, neither of us will be dancing tonight, James said firmly. But I want to dance, Emma pouted. Sorry, dear. I told you last night that I didn't want to slow dance and you completely ignored me, James reminded her. There will be no dancing tonight. Annoyed, Emma left their table to mingle with other guests. James noticed that she seemed to be avoiding William Miller. Every now and then she glanced at James as if checking whether he was watching her. After a couple of hours, Emma returned to their table. A few of us are going to the jacuzzi. Do you want to join? she asked. We're not going, James said evenly. Our evening is over. Pack your things. We're leaving. What's wrong with you? Emma snapped. I'm going to the jacuzzi. James shot her an icy look. I said pack your things and we're leaving. Something in his expression made Emma freeze. Without another word, she gathered her things and followed James to the elevator. Once they were back in their room, she turned on him in fury. What's your problem? What's gotten into you? She demanded. It's not what's gotten into me, James growled. I'm just curious how many more times you'll offer me scraps after someone else. The blood drained from Emma's face. Oh, God, how did you find out? James cut her off by flinging open the glass balcony door. Shut up, he snarled, taking a menacing step toward her. Emma's eyes widened in fear. She fled to the bedroom, slamming and locking the door behind her. James, please, let's talk, she begged through the door. You'll act normal at the wedding, but between us it's over, James said coldly. Don't say that, Emma sobbed. I love you. James slammed his palm against the door, making Emma cry out. Shut up. It's over between us. He listened to her muffled sobs for a few minutes before quietly leaving the room. James headed to the business center to make copies of the incriminating photos Robert had given him. He also changed his return flight to the midnight redye. The atmosphere was unbearably tense the next morning as James and Emma prepared for the wedding. James kept a close eye on her. Around noon, she went to get ready with the other bridesmaids. 
James noticed several women trying to console the clearly distraught Emma. During the ceremony and the reception, James remained silent, his expression hard. When Emma cautiously asked if they would be dancing that evening, he replied with biting sarcasm, Yes, all the way to rock bottom. And if I see anything resembling Thursday, your room key might not work. Everything's fine, Emma quickly reassured him. I only want to dance with you. They didn't dance. James noticed Emma was desperate to talk, but he didn't give her the chance. Every time he brought her a drink, he spiked it with a sleeping pill. By the time the bride and groom had said their goodbyes to the guests, Emma was nearly unconscious. I don't feel well, she mumbled. Can we go back to the room? As soon as Emma passed out, James gathered his things. He took her passport, driver's license, credit cards, and work documents. In Emma's suitcase, he placed incriminating photos with a note saying that he had already left for home. James also prepared a package for Jennifer Miller, including the photos and a t-shirt Emma had worn. He added a note explaining what he had discovered about Jennifer's husband, William, and Emma. While waiting for a taxi to the airport, James noticed that William was still enjoying himself with the wedding guests. James approached him and handed him the package for Jennifer. William, I hope your divorce will be the most painful in history, he said coldly. You'll be looking over your shoulder for a long time. Who knows when it will happen, but we're not done yet. Fear flickered in William's eyes, but James didn't stick around. As his taxi pulled away from the resort, he saw security escorting a bloodied William out of the reception area. James returned home early on Sunday morning, tired but grimly satisfied. He knew Emma would soon wake up and realize he was gone. Sure enough, his phone lit up with frantic messages and calls from her. Where are you? We need to leave for the airport in two hours. Why didn't you wake me up? Emma's panicked voice filled James's voicemail. He allowed himself a small smile and sent a reply. I'm already home. Your passport, license, credit cards, and court documents are on the kitchen table. I won't be here when you return. Emma's next message dripped with venom. You're insane. I'm stuck here. I need to be in court tomorrow morning. Unable to resist twisting the knife further, James replied, So sad. You weren't part of my plans. Will you survive this? Oh, wait, of course you will. You were everywhere on Friday afternoon. Then he sent the incriminating photos to Emma and also shared them with the entire wedding party and Emma's parents. The next voicemail was barely intelligible through her sobs. I can't get help with my passport until tomorrow, Emma whimpered. Oh God, she's going to fire me. Please help me do something. James deleted the pathetic message without responding. Hours later, he received another message from Emma. She suspended me without pay for a month. She didn't say anything about the photos. Lost your husband, wrecked your career, lost the respect of your friends and family, James retorted. All for a little fun. What a shame. When you said you wanted to unwind, I never imagined. You must have shown me. Please, James, no divorce, Emma begged. When can we talk? Her pleas only fueled James's rage. It's easy to profess love when you've ruined everything for yourself, he sneered. I'm turning off my phone. If you can get here in 30 minutes, I'll listen to what you have to say. True to his word, James turned off his phone. He knew Emma had no way of getting there that quickly. He had no intention of listening to her excuses or giving her a second chance. The next day, James started looking for a new place to live. He found an inn close to work that had availability for the next three weeks. The innkeeper, Margaret, seemed a bit reserved, but James liked the place. It had a hot tub and garage parking. Settling into his temporary home, James began to learn more about Margaret. She was a widow, nearing her 60th birthday, with two grown daughters. One lived far away, and the other, Amelia, lived nearby with her young daughter. James began to open up to Margaret, sharing his situation with Emma. Although he didn't expect any answers, the mere fact that someone was listening proved therapeutic for him. Margaret became a sort of counselor to him helping him process his anger and pain. A few days later, James met with a divorce lawyer to initiate the process with Emma. The lawyer quickly filed the papers and planned to serve them to Emma on Thursday. James also began moving his assets to protect them. Emma continued to leave desperate voicemails and send text messages. James mostly ignored them, 
but eventually agreed to meet her for dinner on Thursday evening. When they met, Emma immediately began pleading. James, I don't want a divorce, she said in a trembling voice. There has to be some way for you to forgive me. What do I need to do? Emma, I've been firm for the last six months, James said, his voice steady. We are not getting back together. But I want you, she begged, tears welling up in her eyes. At that moment, Amelia, sitting nearby, decided to intervene. There are hundreds of women in this town who would dream of being with James, she said, speaking directly to Emma. He could live a long and happy life with any one of them. But he won't be able to live a long and happy life with you because he won't be able to trust you, Amelia continued, her voice filled with both empathy and determination. You say you love him, but how can you torment this man, making him doubt what you're doing and why? Every time you're apart, for the next fifty years, he'll be consumed with doubt. That's not a life. Emma's face contorted at Amelia's words. James nodded in agreement. Do you need someone to talk to? He asked gently. You're not listening to me, but everything she's saying is the truth. I loved you more than I can describe, but that wasn't enough for you. I don't want to live a life where my stomach churns because I don't know what you're up to. Feeling defeated, Emma made her way to the door. Standing on the porch, she turned one last time. I love you, James, she said quietly. Remembering something, James pulled out an unopened envelope. Here, take this. I never found the time to read it. It was a letter Emma had written to him months ago, trying to explain her actions. She stared at the envelope for a few seconds before saying, Let me tell you what it says. I admit I agreed to meet William for fun, but when I walked into his room I was overwhelmed with guilt before anything happened. William got angry and after a while started to act aggressively. He forced me to do it. James shook his head in disbelief. Bravo. I expected nothing less than an exceptional story. You took what you intended to do and painted yourself as the victim. I pity you if that's true, but you just as easily could have stayed away or refused on the phone. You didn't refuse. You went, and the rest is history. James, you have the right to doubt me, but it's the truth, Emma insisted. And to ease your mind, that was the only time I disrespected you in our marriage. Emma, you're right. I do have to doubt everything that was between us, James said wearily. It seems you were so close to sparing us this pain, but you didn't. It's time for you to go. After Emma left, Amelia turned to James. I think she's telling the truth, she said quietly. Maybe a stronger man could forgive her. James nodded. I know, but I can't be that man. How long do these conflicting emotions last? I'll let you know when I'm done, Amelia replied with a sad smile. Over time, James began to feel that he and Amelia were growing closer. At first, they started dating casually, both wary of rushing into new relationships too quickly. But in each other's company, they found comfort and understanding. Seven months after his divorce from Emma was finalized, James received an invitation to her wedding. This news stirred unexpected emotions in him. That evening, over dinner with Amelia and Margaret, he shared the invitation. Oh. Amelia softly said after reading it. Well, there it is. You've been officially replaced. James nodded, his expression clouded. It just stirred up feelings I didn't even know I had, he admitted. Amelia flipped the invitation and read aloud. James, I intend to be the most faithful and loving wife the world has ever known, Emma. Well, she'll be the second after me, Amelia said with a wry smile. Whoever chooses me will get the most faithful and loving wife the world has ever known. And by the way, we're not going to her wedding. There was a moment between them, full of unspoken meaning. Then James cleared his throat and asked, Any suggestions? Amelia's eyes sparkled. No, but I'm starting to lose patience. I have my eye on someone. He's just over thirty, but he still lives with my mom. He probably has unresolved issues, don't you think? James laughed, but then grew serious. He called Amelia's daughter, Olivia, into the room. Olivia, I'm thinking of asking your mom to spend more time with me. What do you think about that? The girl thought for a moment. Mom smiles when she sees you, she said without much emotion. Grandma smiles when she sees you too. She waits by the window and says, James has come home. Amelia and Margaret exchanged glances, holding back laughter. 
James continued. Well, I thought I'd spend more time where you live. That won't upset Grandma, will it? Margaret intervened. Sweetheart, I'll see you just as often as always. I'm sure James and your mom will make sure I won't be lonely. James, will you read me bedtime stories? Olivia asked, hopefully. Any time, dear, James promised. Taking a deep breath, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a small box. Dropping to one knee, he opened it to reveal a ring. Amelia, will you marry me? Tears of joy filled Amelia's eyes. Yes, she said, embracing James and holding him close. The next day, James moved his belongings from Margaret's house to Amelia's. As they settled into their new life, James and Amelia worked on overcoming past hurts and insecurities. They agreed never to attend parties alone to avoid misunderstandings and jealousy. Their wedding was a joyous event, with Olivia as the charming flower girl. James refrained from sending Emma a wedding announcement, choosing instead to focus on his future with Amelia and Olivia. Over time, James and Amelia's relationship deepened. They supported each other as they blended their families and navigated co-parenting with Amelia's ex-husband Charles during custody exchanges. James and Olivia became best friends. He read her bedtime stories, and she showed him her intricate dollhouses. Three years after their wedding, James and Amelia decided to grow their family. They had a baby boy, and Olivia became a caring big sister. Despite all the ups and downs, James and Amelia remained devoted to each other, learning important lessons about trust, communication, and forgiveness from their past. As for Emma, she divorced eight months after her own wedding, caught once again in an affair, this time losing everything. My friend, and this is the end of the story. If you liked this story, then put your royal like and subscribe to the channel. May the force be with you.